Hello everyone. I am very excited about today's video and um, I wanted to come on and do a personal introduction to it because it's special to me. Many of you know that my husband and I just moved to California this last summer and uh, we've been working really hard on renovating. But the fun fact is that when my husband went to lift up the old vinyl in this house, which looked like it could have been as old as the house, I think it is, in 1940s, and then the um, second set of vinyl looked like it was maybe 1960s, I don't know, but it was like this time capsule looking at these old vinyl floors that were pulling up. And um, then look what we found. We found a massive amount of newspapers that come from 1944. So apparently that is when they put in their first vinyl type floor. And I will show you a picture of the floor as we saw it and before and then I'll show you a picture of the floor that uh, my husband has put in on top of all this. But all of these papers, let me show you a couple more, uh, were found underneath the vinyl. And they had them laid out flat, you know, they wanted it to protect uh, moisture barrier, you know. Uh, but just tons tons of newspaper and um, so but today um, I mean if you're interested in seeing what it all looked like tomorrow's upload is going to be just page turning and I'll go through all of it and it's just to me that's just like oh so rewarding and I'll have a video keepsake of these newspapers uh, but today all we're going to do is go through this front to back. And I just want to read for those of you who like the soft spoken type video. That's what today is. And tomorrow we'll just do page turning. Tomorrow. I usually uh, upload my videos in consecutive order. But so anyway, I hope you're uh, as interested as I am because I just love history and I discovered a bit of it in my house. So excited. So here we go. Without further ado, well, first the before and after pictures and then we'll read. Okay. Okay, here we are. This Week magazine, San Francisco Chronicle, magazine section, October 15th, 1944. Your life since 1940. What has happened to you during America's four war years and what now lies ahead? That article's on page four. Okay. for laundry soap does everything. <laughs> Let's start with the first article. It's called Alchemist. In a skylight room in midtown Manhattan, Julian Bellow makes olfactory magic eight hours a day. Bellow is one of the world's top notch perfume blenders. He mixes essences and scents in his small laboratory until he achieves a new compound, which he then sells to perfume manufacturers. They bottle it under an intriguing name, send it on its way until it finally arrives behind the ears of glamorous women. Inventing a new perfume is an art like composing a symphony, Bello believes. A cosmetic manufacturer recently asked him to develop a fragrance suggesting orange trees in Arabia. 
another one wanted a person a perfume exuding the aroma of a Connecticut forest after the rain inspiration using such ideas as starting points Bello thinks them over until a new blend takes shape in his mind he then secludes himself in his lab where he has about 700 bottles of every conceivable or odor ranging from Bulgarian attar of roses which costs $800 a pound now you gotta keep in mind you guys that this is back in 1944 $800 a pound back then to a synthetic lilac Bello may weave together as many as 50 different oils to make a new blend he says American women seem to prefer heavily sensuous perfumes, while Europeans like light, flowery ones. It may take from two days to three months to create a new blend. He often tries hundreds of combinations to get the final effect. A spry, balding gentleman of over 50, Julien Below, was living in Nice, France, when he became fascinated by perfumes. And it took him five years of home experimentation and much study to learn all the closely guarded secrets of the art. Bello came to America in 1939. He describes the odors of New York as asphyxiating. <laughs> but says bad smells do not upset his sensitive nose. His favorite scent is not any of the exotic, expensive blends he has invented. His favorite scent. It is just a simple rose in a garden. Nobody, he says, could invent a perfume like that of a freshly cut rose. The best perf perfumer of all. Parf Fumier. Ah, <laughs> oh, it is nature. I agree, nature it has the most best perfume. But we want to wear nature. Uh, I do anyway. I'd love to be able to get the scent of a pine tree. And be able to wear that everywhere I go. Okay, here's an article called The Politician by James Hilton. Ask yourself what that term means. Then read what this noted author has to say about it. The politician. One of the most hopeful signs of today is that so many people are talking about tomorrow. And, and talking sense, too. Indeed, anyone with the ears open who travels about America could easily get an impression that never before has a nation at war been freer in speech and thought more calmly aware of what things are all about, or better equipped to tackle the future with the right proportion of idealism and shrewdness. Certainly no nation at war has ever had less war hysteria. That is, however, something that bothers me a bit, and might bother you also if you make a simple experiment and ponder on the results. When next you hear someone discuss the problems of the future, interestingly, informatively, or with special intelligence, suggest to him that he ought to be in politics. Say it sincerely, not sarcastically. Let him be sarcastic when he replies, because it's ten to one he will be... that he, that he will be... <laughs> po political... Oh, and he says, not he. What do you take him for? <laughs> As one highly intelligent youth put it to me recently, I'd be no good at soapbox oratory and baby kissing. I hate making a lot of promises. In politics, however tough the problems are, you've got to pretend to know all the answers. I wouldn't be good at that because I don't know all the answers and I know I don't. And as... I've never wasted time trying to kid myself. 
I don't think I'd be much of a success at getting Tom, Dick, and Harry. I'd rather leave that to the politicians. <laughs> the politicians. You see what has happened? These words politicians and politics are well on their way downhill. Already they are not complimentary. Soon, at their present rate, they will be the sort of thing you could sue about. This is no mere matter for language students. It reflects a trend of vital importance in our national life and potentially also of great damage. For politics, by definition, is the art of government. And that means the art of all arts that humanity will most depend on during the difficult years ahead. And it is odd, to say the least, that at a time when we are fighting a war to preserve, among other things, the ideas and ideals of democracy, we should think so little of the practical job of making it work. That if Junior were suddenly to announce, Dad, I've decided to be a politician when I grow up, many a father would be peeved rather than pleased. Of course, he would have his reasons, and the chief is, uh, is what the word politics too often connotes. Somehow we must break away from this because it is essential if we are to remain democratic. That democracy should have first pick of all the first-rate minds that are now reaching maturity. We have great leaders today, it is true, but what of tomorrow? How can we tempt youth, honor, idealism and intelligence into the job of jobs, which is and will be for as long as we can look ahead, that of bringing the art and science of government up to the level to which human brains have already brought. Uh, see, that word's missing because there's a hole here. Uh, brought to many other arts and scientists, sciences. If we something, civilization itself will go down in ruins. Perhaps we can begin by giving an honest answer to the young man who objected to soap boxes and baby kissing. Perhaps we can say, all right, don't do that. See what happens if you leave it out. As for kidding, Tom, Dick, and Harry, don't even try. Just treat them as that as what they mostly are nowadays, thoughtful, modern-spirited people who are just as wary of believing soft promises as you are of making them. They don't want to be kidded. They want to have faith in you, and also, incidentally, you'd better have faith in them, because that is democracy. Okay. Your Life Since 1940 and Things to Come by Vernon Pope. So amazing that this paper survived. It was, uh, there's a, still a staple in here. Um, from when they laid this down, it was flat like this. It's amazing. The staple in here is over 80 years old. Okay. Our war effort is just four years old. What has it done to your life? And what will it do in the days ahead? How have we been getting along since Caribbean cruises went out and Frank Sinatra came in, since the servants became rarer than mink and Mersey Dotes became a kind of anthem since the boys went off to the war and the girls took to whistling at men? It's four years now since 16,628,943 young Americans registered for the first peacetime draft in our history and the emotions of millions of American families were catapulted into the midst of war. Years that have been, that have seen girls transformed into trainmen 
barbers, newspapers, copy boys, while the boys and their fathers were writing glorious new pages in our saga in Bataan, Saipan, St. Lo, and on the assembly line exciting, maddening, tragic, triumphant years, and because they happened to us Americans, funny years as well. Funny. Let's examine them. We'll begin with the story of America's women. Today, almost every one of every three factory workers is a woman. But in early 1942, more than one plant blossomed out with the old warning. No profanity women working inside. The wax and waves came into existence and later the girl marines and the New York Herald Tribune headline read, Marine Corporal Bride. In late summer 1942, Hudson Motor hired girls as auxiliary MPs, giving them pistol and jiu-jitsu training. That fall, Curtis Wright Buffalo started a day nursery, consolidated Volte in stalled Dorothy Dixie's to solve emotional problems. The first woman traffic cop appeared. Girls replaced pin boys in p bowling alleys, and a Pennsylvania high school hired the first girl football coach. The sweater girl controversy began when 53 were sent home by Vought Sikorsky aircraft for looking too distracting. <laughs> Women were driving cabs, streetcars, buses, acting as conductors, bellhops, car washers, radio announcers, and cowgirls. 4,000 lumber jills were busy in the Northwest. Mainbacher designed wave uniforms. Lily Dodge did turbans for aircraft workers. Next, look at the amazing way we've been getting along minus scads of things we all used to think were indispensable. Norfolk thieves stole tires but ignored a diamond ring. <laughs> they left this note. Roses are red, violets are blue, we like your jewels, but your tires are new. <laughs> Nylon was banished and leg paint took the place of stockings. Men's vests were outlawed. In April 1942, uh, a woman rented a safe deposit box for her spare girdle. A Hollywood restaurant dreamed up plenty of coffee, first cup five cents, second cup a hundred dollars. A Brooklyn housewife asked her uh, rationing board for the price ceiling on black market gas. Shoes were third highest in a, in a flood of hijacking. Shoes were third highest in a flood of hijacking. First being liquor and rayon Fuel shortages closed stores in Boston and schools in Philadelphia. Lodgers took their alarm clocks along to work, lest they be stolen in their absence. Awakening services did a big business rousing shifts of war workers. Hollywood needed stars to replace servicemen Robert Montgomery, Jimmy Stewart, Clark Gable, and many others. Police quelled riots after indiscreet retainers advertised small loots of electric irons. It is so amazing. Millions of little things went to make up America's day-to-day -day life. New words crowded into language. Jeep, G.I. Joe, pinup girl, door key children, Bobby Socks Brigade, Swing Shift, V-Mail, an Osage Indian introduced himself and family. I'm Brave Eagle. This is my son, Fighting Bird, and my grandson, Four Motored Bomber. <laughs> a bus overlooked a Virginia town during a blackout and carried a passenger five miles too far. <laughs> Tulane Griffin. 
Tulane. Tulane. I guess that's a person. Tulane graduated one man from its law college in June. Oh, it's a law college. Uh, 43. In Los Angeles, the R.C. Averys, both 73, celebrated their golden wedding anniversary by taking 10 minutes off from work in a plane factory. Restaurants Riley revived the gag. Be nice to the waiter. We can always get customers. Um, that kind of goes over my head, but oh well. Emily Post amended the laws of hospitality so hosts might be frank about the war restrictions. Colleges cut four-year courses to three. Wedding gown and ring sales leaped. The birth rate beat all records since 1929. Child delinquency rose as mothers took four jobs. Department store sales went up and up. In Henry, Illinois, they decided to sell the poorhouse. Miami Beach shops offered hand-painted neckties at $250. The national debt went over... I don't even know what that number is. $200 billion? And 10,300,000 people paid an income tax for the first time in 1944. OPA made the Stork Club roll back coffee from 50 cents to 35 cents a cup. Gasoline-less citizens stayed home evenings, so night burglaries dropped 10%. Daytime thefts rose 7%. Oh my gosh. Sales of black lingerie hit an all-time high. Vitamin pills boomed. One subject that dropped out of our conversation was unemployment. New Orleans Roosevelt Hotel advertising for elevator operators said no one under 65 need apply. Mrs. Williams Burns of New Newark, New Jersey, seeking a maid, offered use of her mink coat on the girl's day off. A Los Angeles cafe man had his window permanently lettered in gold. Monterey Cafe waitress wanted. Oh my gosh. A Kansas City nightclub owner used his two daughters as waitresses, his wife as hostess, and his ex-wife as hat check girl, his father as doorman. The city editor of a Springfield, Illinois paper was criticized for not carrying a picture of the latest group of selectees. His defense, my photographer was in that group. <laughs> the only shoeshine parlor left in North Hollywood proudly displayed a notice. Shines by appointment only. Cleveland socialites studied housekeeping in a school they'd founded. For millions of us, the big problem was a place to live. Country clubs became workers' dormitories. Okay, country clubs became workers' dormitories and abandoned trolley cars were apartment houses. Wow. A Los Angeles reporter arrived with police at a murder scene and applied for the victim's apartment. Said the landlady, it's already rented to the police sergeant. War production centers mushroomed. Childersburg, Alabama, jumped from 500 to 6,000 in population. In scores of towns, the YWCA found three-shift renting of the same bed in lodging houses. In Washington, D.C., they found 22 girls sharing seven beds. Wow, that's just, wow. We were always proud of our mobility, but we've had to cut down. In May 1942, Boston Checker Taxi put 10 Victorias in use, and in July, the city granted its first hitching post permit in generations. 
carpool and share a ride programs spread nationwide. Etiquette authorities declared women war workers might thumb rides if they substituted identification tags for thumbs. U.S. planes over Europe were burning more gas than all A ration, A ration holders. Lots of us who couldn't go to war felt we weren't doing enough in our 9 to 5 30 jobs, so we pitched in on the home front. Movie theaters held scrap matinees, but some housewives complained kitchens had been denuded so Junior could see a double feature. Wow. Overzealous salvagers collected bundles of Sunday papers dropped by trucks. Saturday night in Wilton, Connecticut. Movie stars sold bonds or joined USO camp shows. Carol Lombard losing her life on tour. Victory Gardens sprouted in backyards and, all on, on, and on golf courses. Thousands of us enrolled in first aid classes. Other thousands provided long-handled shovels and buckets of sand in our attics. We were ready for anything. A Chicago dancer sold the nylons off her legs for 1500 in bonds. Wow. Blood donations involved millions, and Private John Larson saved by transfusion, worried. What if I have the blood of a giant fan? Me, a Dodger rooter. <laughs> a giant fan. A Los Angeles boy taught his dog to lick war stamps, sold several hundred dollars worth to fascinated spectators. <laughs> and now we're waiting for Johnny to come marching home. Only one million five hundred thousand of the three million war mobilized women are expected to retire from industry. Wow. The Department of Labor sees a total of 20,000 men and women released from war jobs and the armed forces. Probably 18... Am I saying this right? 18... Million? That is million, right? That would be the 100,000. That would be the 1,000. Maybe I'm saying it wrong. I don't know. Prospects are good, say most experts. This will be a good famished. Prospects are good, say, say most experts. This will be a good famished country. War has forced people to save more than is that so that's one billion, right? As much as they would have in fifteen years in nineteen thirty nine, right? The German crack-up will mean a 40% drop in war production, a 30% rise in civilian goods. A Chamber of Commerce poll, poll shows well over 3,500,000 families waiting to buy cars within, next, within six months after the war. Uh, 500,000, 1,500,000 anxious for new homes. Home construction will be going full blast by next summer. Household items, pots, pans, brooms, can openers will appear in quantity early in 1945, as will hardware, bobby pins, girdles, consumer durables should come back more slowly. Some refrigerators by mid-1945 Plenty of washing machines and vacuum cleaners. About two million cars will be turned out for the first year, but the average motorist won't get his hands on one until 1946. Gas rationing will relax in the east, tighten up on the Pacific coast. We still have a Japan to lick. There will be three million to four million new radio sets by next autumn, and typewriters and alarm clocks in abundance. 
most things will be priced at about the 1942 level or 20 to 25 percent over 1939. New cars will cost 25 to 30 percent more than the 1939, 1940 models. New homes will be 30 to 40 percent more than pre-war homes. We know and like one another better. Through rubbing elbows in day nurseries, car sharing, pools, civilian defense, and other community activities, the colonels, Lady and Mrs. O'Grady, and their husbands had discovered their sisters and brothers under the skin. Our young people returning from the far corners of the earth, many with foreign brides, will be less smug about their own particular community, city, and state. Our women with new knowledge of their worth can never resign themselves again to time killing. We'll have way over a million more newlyweds than we would have in normal times, and there's bound to be another marriage boom after the war. With servants rarer for for, time, for some time to come, we'll continue eating out, welcoming, labor-saving home gadgets. We'll have our hands full, learning peacetime tempos, calming the accumulated jitters. But Americans have proven again they can take it. We'll go on taking it, all the while reserving our inalienable right to hate war more than ever. Here's a short story. The bandages were about to be removed, and for Anne, the two most important questions of her life would be answered. All you could see was his mouth. The rest was gauze, yards of it crisscrossing about his head and running vertically down his face and horizontally across his forehead eyes, nose, and chin. Anne stood at the head of the hospital bed, and he was wheeled in by an elderly, orderly, and two nurses, and laid carefully from the stretcher into the gleaming sheets of the bed. This is a hell of a note, Anne heard him say. One of the nurses left with the orderly. The other nurse went to work on a thermometer. First degree burns and concussion, the nurse said laconically. From what? Anne asked. Bomber crash. The bandages are for the burns, mostly. He just came off the ship. San Francisco was getting plenty of hospital ships these days, mostly from New Caledonia. After taking his pulse, the nurse arranged the blanket just right about his swathed jaw and told Anne there was nothing for her to do except keep an eye on him and give him the medicine when he woke up. And with a nod, she glided crisply out the door, closing it quietly behind her. This was all pretty new stuff to Anne. She had been concentrating carefully on assuming something of the remote. In different manner, this trained nurse adopted so uniformly, but she was getting any, but she wasn't getting anywhere with it. To her, patients weren't just patients. They were, heartbreakingly enough, people soldiers who had been fighting a war. They had most disagreeably, disagreeably mixed themselves up with a zero or a machine gun nest and were pretty sick, all of them. You couldn't just toss off men like that and call them the case in Ward 8. That is, not if you had a heart three times your own size and hadn't been around that sort of thing before. Anne's heart was about that size, and she had been a nurse, a nurse's aide, exactly three weeks. 
She'd probably never be much good at fixing hypo needles or changing bandages, but she was certainly the only attendant at the place who could quiet the man in the next ward who per periodically went out of his mind and began screaming. She could convey to him and many others like him a feeling of being cared for, which none of the others could. Anne, glancing at her patient and believing he was still sleeping, was startled to hear him say quite clearly, Bomber crashed my foot. That damned monkey got us be from below. The darned ship just fell apart under us. Oh, Anne's voice held all the horror of the picture he evoked. How did you get out? Parachute, of course, he told her irritably. I wish they'd take those cursed things off my face. It hurts like hell. Here, you take them off. I think you'd better take your medicine. I'll fetch it, and suggested hurriedly. Don't want any medicine. And he was asleep. Well, he certainly wasn't any missionary before he got into the army, and concluded. He couldn't be very old either. She tried to tell how old he was by his mouth. It was a nice mouth, rather on the large side. It reminded her she thought the bandages must be hiding some laugh lines around it. That kind of mouth usually knew everything there was to know about laughing. She was familiar with that kind of mouth. During her lunch hour the next day, Anne stopped by the office where Betts was busy with filing, with files. Looking at case files and personal histories was strictly forbidden, except to the medical bigwigs, but Betts permitted Anne to see them occasionally when no one was about. She seemed to understand it was important to, be, to Anne, and that she know the people behind the bandages and where they came from, what they did before they got into the war. It was part of the magic she seemed to have with them understanding them. Betts told her, consulting the card index, that the patient in 214 went by the name of Jerry Doran. For three agonized seconds, Anne's heart stopped beating. That long, lanky figure lying limply in the hospital bed was Jerry. my husband's name. The striding, laughing, irresponsible Jerry, his face now obliterated by white gauze, nothing to see but his mouth. How could she possibly have not recognized his mouth? Wide, k grinning, good-natured. It was over a year now. She had believed it was just an incident of the past, that if she had even remembered any little thing, it wouldn't matter. She was quite wrong. The past was stirring to life all the poignancy of its longing, all its madness. She didn't need to read the personal history of Jerry Duran. She knew how it went. Gerald Patrick Duran, Irish descent, occupation, reporter. It wouldn't specify the kind of reporter, though. It wouldn't say anything about the way he had covered in Reynolds' divorce case, how he had dug up material butter left buried, and then because he had a soft Irish heart, and because a young girl had cried, he tossed it away and was nearly fired from his paper when he was scooped. The little history would say that Gerald Duran was twenty-five, red hair, blue eyes, six foot two, unmarried, perhaps it wouldn't say unmarried. Ooh, quickly Anne looked at the sheet. Yes, unmarried, no living relatives. She put the personal history back in the file and returned to the ward. Mechanically, she smoothed pillows, turned patients, gave medicine, and smiled and chatted with men. When she came in, they invariably focused their attentions on her each waiting expectantly for her to come to his bedside with a quip or a laugh. Hiya, babe. Hiya, soldier. What's buzzing? Plenty, chum. But it's a big military secret. I'll give you a note to the general's lady when you leave. She'll give you the real dope. The 
foolishness went on from one cot to the next. Not very funny, really. Not very funny when you were facing an amputation next day, perhaps, or had just been told you wouldn't be going back to the front. A wheelchair for you, pal. The next six months, maybe a year. No, it wasn't funny. But the men found an aunt's smile and camaraderie, and especially in her diminutive loveliness, something sweet and precious, and they reached out to it. She didn't get back to Jerry until the next day. The chart reported his condition remarkably improved. Temperature down, pulse normal. Almost the moment she entered the room, he seemed to know who she was. You're the irregular one, he announced with satisfaction. Irregular? That sounds like defamation of character to me, she told him with a smile in her voice. No, slander. But you admit you aren't the regular nurse, don't you? Guilty, she replied. You might say I'm the extracurricular department. You can say that again, sister, but how about a name? Or do they give you a number? Quickly, she thought, don't tell him now. It might not be good for him. It might bring things back, things he doesn't want back. All she could think of in a hurry was Mabel. So she said Mabel. That is undoubtedly the harshest injustice that was ever done. Such a beautiful voice, he commented. Personally, I should prefer Butch or Slug. More refined, too. I suppose it's all in the way you look at it, she observed. You're damned right. I suggest you're married to, I suspect you're married to, he stated with an air of resignation. No, she admitted. No, he almost raised himself up in bed as if he would try to see her. You wouldn't kid me, lady. You see, he resumed more calmly. Me and my alter ego have been having quite an argument about it ever since yesterday. I says to my alter ego, I says, Listen, you jerk, I'll bet you ten to one that girl with a voice like that is already in the clutches of some designing cad. Then my alter ego would come right back and say, What do you think a gal with a voice like that was doing while said cad was making passes at her? And you've overlooked the important point that aforementioned gal hadn't met up with one Jerry Doran, the Jerry Doran who holds all the luck of the Irish right in his great big fist. <laughs> we had it back and forth pretty hot and heavy there for a while. I'm sorry to lose the tin, but it was worth it. And his big mobile mouth began a wicked grin. <laughs> Anne was busy tidying the already tidy room while Jerry was monologuing. When he paused, she changed the subject quickly. What did Dr. Melvin say? She asked. They're taking the bandages off in a few days, he told her, without much conviction. You know, I didn't care much for Doc's tone of voice. I suspect he was doing a lot of gesturing between what he was saying and what he was thinking. I have a sneaking suspicion they don't like the color of my eyes. What do you mean? Anne asked in a breath. She knew, though, quite suddenly what he did mean. Jerry was afraid, afraid he wouldn't be able to see when they removed the bandages. Skip it, he told her, and then into a morose gloom, which Anne tried to dispel with light chatter. His former teasing gaiety was gone, and she looked at him, her heart waited drearily within her. Jerry blind. Those laughing, humorous eyes. Blue eyes. Dulled and lifeless. Anne left the room with tears in her throat, threatening to choke her. Was this to be the destiny of the man she had loved, whom she still loved? She knew now that it was true. The years since they had parted seemed to telescope into nothingness, and she was standing before him, defiant, arrogant, 
blazing with an anger born of the first frustration of her life. That was when he told her he was joining the army corps, and he thought it was wiser to postpone their marriage until he came back. She shrank from the memory of those searing, bitter moments when she had delivered her ultimatum, either marriage then and there or not at all. His pride had refused such an order. He had turned quickly and left, and she could not call him back. She had been thinking of little else except Anne. All she knew was that something she wanted was to be withheld from her. That had never happened to her before, and she hadn't grown up enough then to know she couldn't always go on having exactly what she wanted. It was a miserable conspiracy which had let her believe for so long. People don't change, he would have said. You only change as you grow, and once the pattern is set, it takes more than a guy going off in a bomber to recut the pattern. But he'd been wrong to recut the pattern, but, no, oh, but he'd been wrong. She had recut the pattern, and she knew she had grown up. Two days before the bandages were to be removed, she talked with the crisp, remote nurse, Miss Riggs, who had been attending Jerry most of the time. In spite of her crispness and general detachment, she had been very helpful to Anne when Anne was learning the routine. Anne stopped in the nurse's floor office before she started about her duties. She knew Miss Riggs would be there alone. Miss Riggs, I'd like to know more about Jerry Doran. In 2.14, she began without preamble. Is there really a possibility he'll be blind? She forced herself to ask the question bluntly. Yes, Miss Riggs told her without looking up from her work. Did they operate on his eyes? No, there's nothing wrong with his eyes. Unless shock has affected the nerve strands somewhere in the brain. I shouldn't be telling you this, you know. Yes, but it's important that I know. Why? Miss Riggs looked up curiously. Jerry and I were, well, we were to have been married. Oh, was all Miss Riggs allowed herself to say. Anne returned to Jerry's room, almost two days to wait. Jerry seems to know, too. She wanted to go in to him to reassure him, but that was absurd. Of what could she assure him? Nothing. They must wait. When she entered his room, he was sitting propped up in the little bed, possibly dozing. She couldn't tell. Those ridiculous bandages made him look like a mummy. Only his voice was alive. Hiya, Butch, he waved gaily. Top of the morning to you, Lieutenant, she greeted him. Same to you, sis, he returned. You know, I finally doped it out. Doped what out, she asked. What you look like. I've been putting things together, such as a lilting voice and pattering feet and the odor of quiet perfume. And I've got it. Just what have you got, she demanded. Five foot three of blonde hair and green eyes, he told her with a satisfied smile. Well, you need brushing up on your addition, then. I'll have you know I'm no blonde. Blondes fade. Yeah, that's a point, all right. Personally, I never cared much for blondes myself, but I knew a brunette once, and she didn't work out so well, either. You don't say, Anne's breath came in quick folds hidden behind her light tone. She didn't believe in love, Jerry volunteered. A likely story. What girl doesn't believe in love? Oh, it was all right with her if she could have it the way she wanted. When she couldn't, she wouldn't play. Nice girl, though, he added wistfully. She sounds like a spoiled brat to me, and declared with surprising vehemence. Possibly, but I think she hadn't grown up yet. Maybe she has by now, though. Oh, yes. The doctor was in first thing this morning. He veered to a new topic. Yes, Anne became very busy folding a blanket at the foot of the bed. Yeah, I came right out and asked to know if it was my eyes he was worried about. Funny, 
I felt better after I'd said it. I've been lying here wondering what they thought, not daring to think what I knew they were thinking, but once I had it out... What did he say? Anne clung to the foot of the bed, scarcely breathing. He said he thought I was suffering from shock. Can you tie that? Me. Shock. They're nuts. He said it happens sometimes. The nerves in the retina or something go into a huddle. Pooh, said Anne, pushing a lightness into her voice that she didn't feel at all. Shock isn't anything, really. It wears off gradually. Even if your eyes are bunged up for a while, you'll be all right. You can drown the Irish, you know. You can't drown the Irish, you know. She lowered the bed, and he fell into a peaceful sleep, smiling a little. What a wonderful, wonderful guy, Anne thought, looking at him. And I didn't have the brains of a little pink-striped louse to let him walk right out of my life. Now he's all wrapped up in his own beautiful picture of the girl he wants to fall in love with. This will make the second time I've let him drown. Let him down. <laughs> drown. The early spring sunshine was making happy little passes at the dawn shades in a playful attempt to get in. The room was very still except for a business-like snipping as Dr. Melvin bent over the bandage head and carefully, methodically cut the bandages away. Anne stood over in a corner of the room. They had allowed her to come in. She rather thought Miss Riggs had fixed the hut. Miss Riggs was standing by the door watching the snipping of bandages. Jerry moved his legs restlessly. You're taking a hell of a long time to cut up a few hunks of gauze, he complained. The doctor didn't say anything. He continued cutting. Oh, for your sake, you've done a job on this handsome mug of mine, Jerry resumed after a moment. If I've got the merest suggestion of a scar, I'm going to sue. It was like him to ignore the real thing, the real possibility they were hoping so breathlessly against. Anne began to feel a faintness as she saw the last of the bandages being snipped away. She wanted to run, and she couldn't. Instead, she buried her head in her arms. Damn it all! You've ripped a hunk of skin off my nose, Jerry exploded then. The doctor chuckled. I expect it does feel a little raw, but it'll be all right in a few days. Now open your eyes and let's see how they look. No, Jerry protested grimly. Not just yet. Maybe if you all went away. Right, Dr. Melvin replied and nodded to Miss Riggs. Together they left, seeming to have forgotten Anne, huddled up by the far wall, shaken and white. Jerry's eyes were tightly closed, his face tense and grim. She couldn't see in the dim light how it looked. She, she supposed not much like Jerry's. It was Jerry's eyes that were everything anyway. The rest of his face was just there to frame his laughing blue eyes. Dear God, Anne whispered, let him be able to see, please. Don't let anything be wrong with his eyes. Her breath was dry in her throat where it had tangled with a sob. She came to the bed, standing a little behind it. He wouldn't be able to see her when he opened his eyes. If... Butch? He questioned in a hoarse whisper. Right here, Jerry. A little smile played at the corners of his mouth, and he seemed to relax. Stand at the foot of the bed, please. I want to see you first off. This is going to be a swell show if I can pull it off, he grinned in self-derision. Oh, you'll pull it off all right, Anne assured him, her heart pounding crazily as she moved forward. Well, toots, here goes nothing. Slowly he opened his eyes just a slit, then quickly he opened them wide as quickly closed them. Anne's heart turned over. He hadn't seen her. It's that light, he roared. Too damn much light for this time of year. He tried again, and this time he kept his eyes open a second or two longer. Anne was around the bed. Around the bed. Come here, you spoiled brat. Jerry held out his arms. Come here and let me be sure I'm right about you. 
and he was laughing like a kid trying to get out of bed and hugging Anne at the same time. Miss Riggs and Dr. Melvin reappeared immediately. Jerry heaved a pillow at the doctor who ducked with a total lack of medical dignity. You old son of a gun, Jerry shouted. Anne was crying openly and trying to keep from laughing too. Miss Riggs' precision smile was getting tremulous. All right, Riggsy old girl, he grinned. Have you got the you-know-what-I-asked you to get if I made the grade? Miss Riggs nodded, unable to speak, and handed over a little box which she had been clenching tightly. With a flourish and a bow, Jerry handed the box to Anne, trembling between tears and laughter. This had to be on a sort of lend-lease basis, he told her wistfully. Riggy here knows a man who knows a man who promised to take it back if he didn't pull off the right stunt, if I didn't pull off the right or if you didn't fall for me after I pulled it. Anne opened the little box to the twinkling blue whiteness of a solitary diamond in a setting of white gold. She caught her breath and turned her eyes slowly to Jerry's. You knew me all the time? I wasn't quite sure, he told her with a grin, until you slandered my girl, calling her a spoiled brat. Something about the way you said it. Then Anne began to sob as though her heart would break. Jerry looked at her in panic. Suddenly she flung herself into his arms, burrowing her head in his shoulder. Over the top of that smooth, dark head, he winked solemnly at the nurse and doctor. Those two were almost at the door when the doctor cocked a quizzical look eye at Miss Riggs and hissed under his breath, Rixie, I'll be a son of a gun if you aren't a busy little Cupid. I'd never have suspected you. And together they left the room. Miss Riggs was with face scarlet and Dr. Melvin chuckling softly. The end. Okay, so we have a Ivory Snow ad. Never was there a time when the trim fit of your stockings, their even toned flattery, their wear. Okay. Ivory Snow is different from cake, soap, or flakes. It gives you gentleness. <laughs> so interesting. Here's parquet. Now, I know ivory snow and I know parquet. Perk up your energy with delicious parquet. And now I know that margarine is not good for us. Or at least not compared to butter. The next plague to go. Okay, this is an article about a fight against TV. I think I will skip that because it's not related to the war. So they're advertising pancake and waffle flour and biscuit flour. I've never heard of Globe A1. Wow, I'm actually too young for this. Let's see, this is a 1944 paper and I was Born in 1961. Nature looks good with foliage. You don't. <laughs> so take no chances. Gem blades. That's funny. Wow. Wallets. Cough drop. For whom the bell falls. Mrs. G.I. Joe. Girls won't date other men. They go to parties and mass. These wives don't sit home and mope. They've found a real way to help each other. Those who worry about what war does to marriage haven't met the 600 spirited members of the wives' club. 
so their husbands will really have something solid to come home to. These GI wives have banded together to give their marriages a mooring while their spouses are away. The club was launched soon after Sergeant Harry Nash of Brooklyn went overseas in the spring of 43. His pretty Naomi refused to mope. Instead, she rounded up other war wives and was soon meeting with them once a week to ease mutual loneliness in a variety of ways. Through word of mouth, the club grew until today, 32 chapters stem from New York headquarters and units in many other cities are being organized. The wives are legendary in fighting fronts. The paper they published Mrs. Yank, circulation a thousand, is often passed around battlefields by members' husbands. As a result, other soldiers who see it are always writing their wives to suggest they join too. An army ambulance plane carries their name on its silver nose, for the girls raised 125000 in war bonds to buy it. <laughs> Saving marriages. The wives don't ask for donations or outside help for themselves, though. They help each other find jobs and homes, untangle legal problems, get medical care, learn to cook and handle household stalemates. Members who are experts in each field pitch in their professional advice. One reason war marriages crack up, the girls believe, is that wives suddenly find themselves unable to cope with problems alone and either write despairing letters to their husbands or try to find escape elsewhere. So they look after each other. Take the member who found herself unable to work and care for an infant son, too, yet she needed her job. The Wives Club Housing Bureau located a desperately lonely member who didn't have to work, but wanted someone to share her home. Now the working wife goes off to her job with her mind at ease, knowing her roommate is happy to share the rent, companionship, and care for both of their babies. Sometimes members bring girls into the group who need help, even though it is definitely not a charity organization. And one member discovered that a soldier's wife was being evicted. She was soon to have a baby. Since she had no family to turn to, the wives stepped in. They found her a part-time job, loaned her $100 to tide her over out of members' pockets, and even located a doctor to care for her. Today she's working enthusiastically for the wives and has a firm foundation for a happy marriage when her husband returns. There's many more stories about what they do. It's an extensive article about the things that the wives uh, is so interesting. And here's an ad. <laughs> smile, plain girl, smile. Make your smile your lucky charm. Help keep it bright and sparkling with Ipana and massage. I wonder what Ipana. Open your eyes, plain girl. Take a look at the girls who get the most phone calls and dates. Most often they are not the prettiest in the crowd, but they all know how to smile. So smile, plain girl, smile. Not timid, half-hearted smile, but a smile that is bright and appealing, that lights your face like the sunshine. But remember, for a smile like that, you need sparkling teeth, and sparkling to be teeth depend much on firm, healthy gums. <laughs> Cute. Okay, it's easy as ABC. There's an ad for painting. Paint right over wallpaper. Kim Tone. It's a wall finish that you can paint over wallpaper. Stand in for the general. Can't tell if that's a story or if it's fact, but I think it's a story. Look, softer, smoother skin. But you know, I'm a girl, so of course I read the romance one. Okay. At a football game, you call.
caught a cold or someone passed you a pack of cools. If they made you stand up and cheer, why not make them your regular brand? Smoke them all the time. Switch from hots to cools. Oh my gosh. No surgeon's general warning for smoking. Boston braces, suspenders. Non alcoholic contains refined lanolin because that's for hair. Your hair can look like this with new wild root cream oil. Wow. Shepherd for fine cheese. That is not. No, it's Old Spice. Early American Old Spice. Simple and delightful. Each dollar. These curry recipes come straight from India. Try them. Okay. Out of India, a land of spicy foods came... Trudy Teal, determined to recapture for the home folks the inimitable, tantalizing taste of real curry. For 15 years, this woman's work as a missionary had stationed her in Rangoon and Calcutta, Calcutta, where she ate curries daily and came to love their pungent ways, their sudden, unexpected flavors, and exotic charm. Wherever she traveled, she studied this highly prized national dish, which is varied as varied as the regions of the great continent, subcontinent. When Trudy Teal returned to America, she had written, had a handwritten book of curry recipes to try out on her friends. What is curry? So that's an article on what curry is. That's her. Mojud. That's all you need to know about stockings. <laughs> Pretty risque for 44, 1944. Their quality counts. Maiden form. And I've heard of maiden form. Electrolyte. The real thing, man of tomorrow. The house of tomorrow will be, says my wife, so perfect there's no need to pass. It. I'd gladly stay in it the rest of my life if I just had a man that would match it. <laughs> and more recipes. Millions want them. Presto cooker. Oh my gosh, I think my mom had one of those. See, my mom was born in 37, so she was a child when all of this was happening. Lunch news. What's for lunch? Lady, lady, whatever it is, see how Borden's chive we wedge cut cream cheese makes it twice as interesting. Borden's cream cheese. It's a vet's life. Your war hero is coming home with a lot of new ideas. Lady, watch him. How to adapt military training to the home is a neat little problem for the loving, if somewhat puzzled, families of returned soldiers. In some cases, households have been completely militarized. Wives have been given orders and told to snap into it. Children have been drilled and disciplined and pups instructed in the duties of war dogs. On the other hand, some veterans are enjoying a complete relapse or collapse into civilian life, and that is as regrettable as the other extreme, and families will be sorry. For there are a number of army customs worth continuing. For instance, time. 
When it's five o'clock in the afternoon, the return veteran will say that it's 1,700 hours. This may seem odd, but after all, he's used to it. But when he is out late and one of the kiddies is sent to fetch him, the child should be instructed to plead, Father, dear father, come home with me now. The clock in the steeple strikes zero one hundred. <laughs> Neatness. The ex-soldier soldier probably will be observed automatically putting away his clothes neatly and picking up trash. Foolish indeed is the wife who exclaims, That's wonderful, dear. Did the army teach you that? Thereupon he will blink as if emerging from a daze and mutter, My gosh, I don't have to do this anymore, do I? From then on, he won't. Telephone. Restrain your amusement when he answers a ring on the telephone by speaking crisply into the mouthpiece as follows. John Q. Blank Quarters, Mr. Blank speaking. This saves a lot of helloing and questions. Also, it, found, it sounds formidable enough to discourage anyone who had been planning to demand, guess who this is? That's <laughs> cute. All the different changes. Courtesy. The old army habit of saluting will be easily forgotten, but some veterans may continue to whistle at pretty girls. When a wife or fiancé objects, the whistler should explain, Oh, in the army, it's SOP, standard operating procedure, to whistle when you see a good-looking babe. Oh, is that so? Well, you're out of the army now. Now, look here, I never knew what you want. I never know what you want me to carry over from the army and what you don't. Well, you can still whistle at certain times. Yeah? When? When I get all dressed up, you can whistle at me. <laughs> How to have a smile bright as a silver dollar. Dr. Lyons. Oh, let's see, no dull film. Remains on your hair. Coconut oil shampoo. I can't even imagine that. Mother's boy. In one flash, the little woman showed something she didn't see. Oh, that's, that's another story. It's interesting that they had so many stories in this. Now you can be a better cook than Grandma. Folks bake my sun glow orange cake. Light and velvety fine. Moist and fragrant with the refreshing tang of orange. So here's an actual recipe for orange cake. Oh, that sounds so good. I think orange flavored desserts are second to my favorite of lemon. Mother, they're worth a monarch garment. Monarch. Oh, for your kids. That's a name for and for clothes. Delta Milwaukee Power Tools. They're building a tiki. It looks like a Boy Scout. Sean has a Delta brand saw and a Delta joiner. Jointer. Crystal. Oh, wow. So, so retro. Goodbye, harsh lack laxatives. This is for... Listerine and a septic. For hair. Listerine and a septic for hair. It's supposed to help dandruff. The army's money. The men who handle it have many an odd tale to tell like these. In the army finance department. If the Army Finance Department ever gets around to writing its own history of the war, it probably will select a title something like The Business Side of the World War II, but it will make far from dull fiscal reading if it includes even a handful of the stories that officers who handle the Army's financial transactions throughout the globe have to tell about the humor, the tragedies, and the adventure of their prosaic duties. 
take the case of the army major whose job was to prepare an airstrip on a South Pacific island. Army engineers descended on the island and after surveying the area carefully decided that the only suitable location was the main street of the island's tiny village. So the major climbed into his jeep and drove to the town to talk over the delicate problem with the village chieftain. After the usual salutations, the major explained the situation, winding up with a good neighbor declaration that the Americans did not wish to take anything away from the chief and would be glad to pay him for the land. Getting down, down to the business, he then asked, now, what do you want? Fair exchange. The chief's English was limited, gained mostly from the island traders, so he seized upon the biggest figure he knew. Ten thousand dollars, he said flatly. The major was caught somewhat by surprise, but his sense of psychology did not desert, desert him. Well, how about taking that jeep, he suggested. No, said the chief, who evidently had seen enough American jeeps to satisfy his curiosity. He sat silently studying the major for a moment, then declared abruptly, But I will take those and pointed to a pair of corncob pipes sticking out of the Major's shirt pocket. <laughs> Done, said the Major promptly, and the deal was closed. If Army finance officers ever drove a better bargain, it has not yet found its way into official recognition, but it is already well established that their business acumen has cut many a financial corner. The conduct of a war is big business and presents all the associated problems, says Major General A. H. Carter, the Army's fiscal director. Not only is it big business, it's the biggest business in the world today. The work of the Army Finance Department only begins with the payment of troops. 7,700,000 officers and men who receive approximately one billion a month in some 30 different currencies at countless posts and stations in every corner of the world. Seeing that these men get their money and cash on the barrel head as soon after the first of each month as possible, whether it be rubles in Russia or pounds in Great Britain, lire, lire in Italy, lira, the first task of the finance officers next to mail from home and plenty of good food the army rates prompt payment of its men highest in the maintenance of morale at the front lines the finance officer is a welcome sight at the first of each month sweeping the country, appealing as it does to housewives, war workers, students, and secretaries. 
stories you must keep on the job on those inevitable days of the month designed by a doctor to be worn internally damn bags is made of surgical cotton compressed and dainty applicators no belt or pin is required no external pads no bulk to show handy to carry and speedy to change no odor can form no disposal difficulties sold at drugstores notion counters all month's supply will go into your purse the economy box contains four months supply so this is when damp packs was invented wow man of all trades a pipe organ builder must have a weird assortment of talents here's an example Rinso white, even little Penny noticed how Rinso soapy rich suds get out more dirt. Wow. Penny and her mother both whistle this. Well, I can't read music, so I can't whistle that for you. When you're warming up for a cold winter, Maxwell House, Maxwell House, you guys, Maxwell House has been around for a long time. Look at that. Soldier named Bombo. A true story by Commander Attilio Gatti. Attilio. The Congo boy heard the white man's war drums and answered. When the war brought our last African expedition to an end, I gave each of our natives' boys an envelope with our New York address typed on it. My wife even pa uh, pasted a Belgian Congo stamp on each envelope. If you ever need anything, we told the boys, write to us and we will do what we can. That was in October 1939. After that, we read in the papers brief notes about Belgian Congo native troops valiantly fighting with the Allies, and we often wondered if any of our ex-boys had joined the force public and seen action, but we never heard from any of them. They have forgotten us, we said. Then the other day, one letter came. It was painfully penciled in Kingwana language, and it said to the good master of old from his boy whose name is Bombo, and whom he often called the ever-scared one, health, peace, and prosperity. This writing is not for help, but for glad news. The peanut crop is good. The game is plentiful. The children are growing. The wives are faring well. The one was sick when the drums first spoke that the evil yellow man and the evil white men had gone to war against the Belgians, the Frenchmen, the Americans, and their friends. They said that the enemies were killing even the men and women who heal the wounded, even the men and women of God who taught me to worship the true Lord, to read the written word, and to write it. My feet took me away from the village. My heart took me where the soldiers have their camp. There the white doctor did his magic. He peered into my eyes and ears. He knocked at my chest. He pierced my arms with needles, loaded with white man's medicine, and lo, I was a soldier. I was made to march and turn and stop until the white man lieutenant gave me a rifle to carry on my shoulder for many a long hour. Then I learned to lay my cheek on it, to close one eye and peep with the other in a little hole, and to put with to pull with my forefinger, and lo, the rifle gave out a thunder, and my heart quivered with fear, and my soldier was numb, my shoulder was numb with pain, but the bullet had gone in the middle of a round piece of paper. So the white man lieutenant said, and now we go to put bullets in the hearts of the enemies of the good men. After many moons of travel, the white man lieutenant said, Soldiers, our enemies are there. Soldiers, the enemies are there. And one of them, who was not to be seen, lifted his gun toward the white man's lieutenant. But I heard his movement in an ambush and put a bullet in his heart first. Though I was trembling with fright, I was made a corporal because my ears had proved good. Then another day I saw that the white 
man lieutenant was about to walk over a strange trap, so my feet ran ahead of him, and my hands uncovered the trap and pulled it out, and the trap made a great thunder, and I was much scared. But all was well, for I was the only wounded, and the white lieutenant is not dead. Then the white man colonel came to the hospital, and I was weak with loss of blood and much fright. But he had only come to pin a medal on my chest, because my eyes had proved good. And he pinned the medal. He said, Now you are healed. Go back to your village and be the chief, which is a great honor and good. But I was unable to speak. Instead, I laughed and laughed. And the white man colonel said, Why do you laugh like a big champion, chimpanzee? And I said, Because the pin is tickling my chest. So everyone laughed like a big chimpanzee. And now I am back, and the wives are well again. So is the peanut crop, and so I wish to you, your faithful boy, Bombo. On the other side of the page there were more lines. My eyes had some difficulty in reading by now. They were even more blurred because I finished reading the following lines. The words are my own, but not the writing, because my two hands are no longer with me. The trap took them away in its thunder, but it matters not, because the other men now write and work and hunt for me, and all is well, because the trap took away my eyes too, but my ears are still good. Oh my gosh. Mm. That makes me cry. That's like such an amazing attitude. Oh my goodness. Worsted text makes you look taller, full chested, and slim hipped. <laughs> well, sold in the following stores in this area. These are the names of the stores that the San Francisco Chronicle, Anaheim, Bakersfield, Belvedere Gardens, Berkeley, Burbank, oh my gosh, all these towns, Santa Ana, Torrance, Vallejo. My town is not in here because my town is too small. These are all the big cities of California. So that's where you could get this. San Francisco Chronicles magazine. I just think that was so awesome and I really hope you enjoyed this look into the past. So tomorrow's upload will be looking through all of these papers with no talking. Okay, thank you for joining me on